Good evening, everyone. On any given day, I have roughly a dozen difficult conversations. These are usually with students, and they revolve around the finer points of our school policies, such as gate closure, that's a popular one, dress code, and why it's inappropriate to spray your friend in the face with the bathroom toilet hose. But what exactly is a difficult conversation? Well, put simply, it's a conversation that's difficult for you to have. It's any conversation that makes you cringe, makes you sweat, makes you cry, makes you rave, rant, possibly toss and turn at night thinking, man, if only I had said that, or tomorrow I'm going to tell it to him. Moreover, a difficult conversation might be difficult for you, but not for me. So you might find it difficult to talk to your teachers about grades, you might find it difficult to talk to your parents about money, or you may find it difficult to tell your friends, no, I'm not going to play FIFA all weekend, I'm going to do my homework. Well, if you spend any time on this planet interacting with people, chances are you've had at least one conversation that's left you feeling angry, disheartened, sad, upset, destabilized. You may even be locked into a difficult conversation right now. For the first 30 years of my life, I didn't really think there was a lot we could do to mitigate the negative effects of difficult conversations. I thought, well, I'm right. Of course I am. I'm always right about everything. Everybody knows that. And if other people just can't acknowledge it, well, then they're either unforgivably unintelligent or they're just plain mean. I gave up hope that I could actually change anyone. So I thought, well, the best I can hope for is a decisive victory, maybe a booming mic drop, and then exit stage left. Fortunately, as I progressed in life, having those conversations that way didn't really leave me much uh, satisfaction. If anything, it caused my relationships professionally and personally to deteriorate, and I ended up feeling bad a lot of the time. When I stepped into administration in schools, I was having more conversations more regularly with more people, simply because you interact with a whole host of different people than you do when you're a teacher. I wanted answers, and I wanted a different way. Thankfully, about two years ago, I made a very good friend and who became a personal mentor to me named Ian Hoke, and uh, he introduced me to a book called Having Difficult Conversations, How to Discuss the Things That Matter Most by Douglas Stone, Bruce Patton, and Sheila Heen. Finally, there was a different way. I started to see the light. Now, I realized the way I just said that made it sound like I read the book. I did not, at least not at the time. I just couldn't fathom going home and reading about different conversations or having them all day long. It was becoming a, a slog. And yet, my, my mentor was patient and persistent, and he decided he was just going to train me anyway. So, he would sit in and listen while I talked to teachers, students, parents. He would give me notes on my facial expressions, my posture, my affect, my language. Soon, I was taking more of an inquiry stance, and I was assuming positive intentions, and to my great relief, Difficult conversations were becoming less difficult. So I thought, okay, finally, it's about time to read the book. So I bit the bullet, cracked it open, and had a good read. I'm glad I did, but it was not pleasant, I have to say. Contrary to all intuitive sense, and frankly desire, that we all take into having difficult conversations for vengeance, the authors are actually advocating a different way. Moreover, they were starting to tell me that actually the people I was having conversations with, all these, these difficult people out there actually weren't the problem. I was. Specifically, the way that I perceived, prepared for, entered into, and processed those difficult conversations. It was a hard pill to swallow, especially for someone who's always right. Well, it forced me to do two things. First, I had to acknowledge that A, I didn't really know as much as I thought I did. I'm not a mind reader, and I don't know the intentions and thoughts of other people I'm talking to. Second, if a conversation feels difficult, it's because I have strong emotions that I have to deal with before those emotions grab the steering wheel from my brain and wrench us all off the road. So in other words, I had to change. To sum up these two points in an easy way, I learned that I had to be a detective and, in the delicious phraseology of the authors, I learned that I had to have my emotions before they had me. More on that in a minute. But first, what does it mean to be a detective? Well, it means asking good questions, being inquisitive, gathering evidence and data, not jumping to conclusions. 
More importantly, it means not interrogating, laying traps, or asking questions that are actually accusations, such as, what kind of a person would actually spend all their time playing FIFA rather than being with their family? Doesn't feel so nice. An amazing thing about being a detective is that when you ask a person a question, you actually learn something. Your feeling and your perspective on the issue might even change. You might realize that actually, no, you're not right, and you need to change. The other thing is that when you ask a person a question, rather than leveling an accusation, they're less likely to want to fight you. Now, I deal with teenagers all the time. I've probably had difficult conversations with many of the students in our lovely audience tonight. And one thing I've learned is that if you go in hard with an accusation, it is not going to end well for you. In fact, the limbic response system in the brain is often triggered by aggression, accusation, and general violence. So if you go in with a, an accusation rather than a question, the limbic system will trigger someone, that is to say, the survival mechanisms or the fight or flight response, to no longer talk. We're not talking, we're fighting. So if you want to have better conversations, ask questions, don't level accusations. The other part of the puzzle here, how to have your emotions before they have you. What does that mean? Well, on Oscar night, Will Smith demonstrated to the world the opposite of what it means to have your emotions before they have you when he delivered a violent, open-palmed slap to the face of an esteemed colleague and friend. Clearly in this moment, he was not having his emotions. They were having him. In the course of my life, I've had to learn how to deal with these emotions. Sometimes they're surprising. I think we've all had a moment in our lives where all of a sudden we feel something we didn't know was there. For example, recently, uh, my wife and I discovered we're having a baby boy, and we're very excited about that. <laughs> it's a lifelong dream, and uh, we we're so happy to hear this news. We got right in the car with our little ultrasounds and, and all the documentation and bills and everything. Started driving home, and all of a sudden, I felt streams of tears pouring down my face. I was ecstatic. I was so happy. I couldn't understand, why am I crying right now? I still don't know. I still don't know. I'm going to have to explain to my baby boy, when I heard you were a boy, I cried. <laughs> Excellent example in vulnerability and manhood. So, that was a strong emotion. When we have difficult conversations, a lot of strong emotions are involved. There are three things we can do to help mitigate those effects. One, we can acknowledge the emotions are there. They're going to happen. Like pressure in a steam cooker, they're coming out one way or another. They can either come out controlled and in a productive way, or they can explode and ruin a lot more than just your dinner. Two, we can try to pinpoint exactly what those emotions are. What am I feeling? What is this? What's going on? And three, we can actually try to map out and explore what the emotions we're going to experience in the conversation could possibly be, so that when they happen, well, I should say if and when they happen, we won't be surprised by them. We'll be able to sort of navigate them and take them uh, in stride. Now, I won't pretend to say to you that I've mastered all these skills and that I'm some sort of uh, Jedi, difficult conversations person, but I will tell you that as soon as I started practicing these techniques, my conversations did improve. My relationships with people improved. I started to see the world a little bit differently and even gather better perspective. Of course, you could say, well, why do I have to change? Why don't all these other people change and then come to me and ask me all the questions because I have all the answers? Well, you can do that. You can wait until everyone sees how brilliant you are and impeccable in your ways. But you'll probably wait a long time. And it might not be very pleasant. Tonight, our theme is disruption. A lot of times we talk about how we can positively disrupt institutions, organizations, even governments and ideas. In other words, how can we disrupt external entities? Seldom do I think we look inwardly and think about how can I disrupt the, the possibly negative things that I'm doing in my life that hinder my ability to make good connections with people and build strong relationships. As we close tonight, I'd encourage us all to just take a step back and consider possibly the ways in which we can disrupt some of the potentially negative patterns of behavior that we inevitably take with all of our wonderful human baggage and emotions into the conversations with people that matter the most. Thank you very much.